is Got Marketing, a fad-free, fluff-free, no-nonsense podcast for marketers looking to work smarter. I'm your host, Mia Feilman, a marketing strategist with over two decades of experience and an entrepreneur. I'm tired of marketers telling you what you want to hear. Instead, I tell you what you need to hear. During the show, I chat with creatives and strategists about all the aspects of marketing, but especially marketing campaigns. Unpacking and dissecting marketing campaigns is what I do for fun. Got Marketing is brought to you by Campaign Del Mar, the marketing education platform where marketers and entrepreneurs go to upskill. Let's dive in, shall we? Hello, everyone. I have often said that playing it safe is the riskiest strategy of all. Sure, bold ideas come with risk, but rolling out same-same marketing is almost guaranteed to fail and be scrolled past. To have this juicy conversation out, I've invited brand strategist and beloved campaign classroom graduate Suji Ford to join me today. Suji is one of the directors of The Good Studio, a branding studio based in sunny Queensland. Welcome. Hi, Mia. Thanks for having me. And congratulations on the launch of the podcast, Boring is Bad for Business. What an awesome, awesome podcast title. Yeah, it's been something that we started in Campaign Classroom together, that idea of like really latching onto Boring is Bad for Business and owning it. And it's evolved now to its own podcast because we just found like Joel and I are always, Joel's the other director of the good studio. We're always talking about it inside the studio and then breaking down like on a project, like how can we make this less boring, what it is, and like we just need to share this out to, to other people. Oh, I'm so excited to have this conversation out with you. But first, I would love to hear your brand story and also your meet cute. Like how did you and Joel decide to become hashtag work married? I've never heard of a meet cute since our meeting story. Yeah, so brand story and our, our meet, is it a meet cute? Is that meet what it's called? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, our story is of how Joel and I met together. So the Good Studio existed before. That was Joel's business. We both were actually at the time designers, sort of art director, creative director, doing it for ourselves as small businesses on the Sunshine Coast. My journey to get to that had been a little bit different. I'd come through agencies as a designer when I was very young, but also just moved move more into the creative strategy was where my role was sitting. And once I left Agency World, I thought, you know what, I'll just go back to design for some reason. I had this, this hunger for that. And I was running my business out of a co-working space, which Joel was also doing the same thing. We worked together alongside each other for a long time and we're always bouncing, you know, off each other. And that's a really great environment to be in. And then we just had this idea that actually, like, why don't we make this a bit bigger than, you know, just ourselves? Like at, at some point we sort of realized like, it's great being a small business, but you can only spread yourself so far. And Joel was really passionate about creative direction. I was getting, you know, more inspired about like I was loving watching other people do great design. But I was like, I still have this kind of hunger for the thirst and for the the strategy. So it's like, even though I was doing these designs, I was like, I wanted to take people through like, why are we actually doing this? Like, what is the long-term vision of your business? And where do, where do you want to be positioned? What type of customers do you want to talk to? And then we'll get to the design later. So it just made sense that we were like, two heads were better than one, split those functions up. And that's how we thought we'd grow the good studio. And so Joel has been on the Sunshine Coast a lot longer than I had. And we're like, let's go under the good studio and then make that that the name for itself. And we sort of see that there's such a, a bit of an opportunity here on the coast. It's still a relatively untouched. And a lot of people through COVID have realized that this is a great place to live. And I think that the business, you know, the economy here is, is growing so much. There's a lot of business here. It's a small business mecca that it's only going to get bigger and we really see such an opportunity to, I guess, be involved in creating really big brands here on the Sunshine Coast that excite people and they're not just, they're not boring. They they have that emotional connection and at the end of the day, those brands get to do more things with less kind of like spending on the money because they're connecting with people and they're inspiring them, they're exciting them, they're moving them. Oh my gosh, I love that so much. There's just opportunity plus, 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 and congratulations. You and Joel make such a great team. You can see that there's great chemistry and energy between you two. So I'm just so thrilled for you. So let's dive in. Why is boring bad for business? 
Oh, well, if you're boring, first of all, you have to work so much harder. And you said it before, playing it safe is the riskiest thing that you can do. You are guaranteed to be looked over. We dived into this in one of our podcasts. I didn't revisit the stats, but there's some like astronomical number of ads that we are being sent every day. Like we know it. We're on devices nonstop. And with all of that, if you cut through not being boring or saying something that's out of the box or saying something that makes people stop for a second and has that emotional like response, that's not being boring. And that's what cuts through the noise. Like you can do all of your ad statistics and where you want to place things, but still you are competing for somebody's attention. So if you want attention, don't be boring. Absolutely. I wholeheartedly agree with that. I think brands are afraid to fail though. So how do you go about validating your ideas and sense checking them so that they don't fail, so that you're lessening the risk of that creative idea, you know, ending up being tone deaf? Yeah. And like scared to fail is such a, it's another topic you go deep on. Like, but I think there's two things like you're always going to fail if you never take a risk, first of all. But then in terms of how do you sense check things, it actually starts with a really boring thing, strategy. You know, And I think it's like you know your customers. So it's like really get to know who are those customers that you're wanting to talk to and understand what are their characteristics like, what are their personality like, who do they socialise with, what are their political beliefs, what are their social beliefs. If you can tap into what your customers and how they think and how they feel and then marry that up with your own beliefs as a brand, whether that's a solo business or even a larger brand and what you stand for, when you have those two talking to each other and you marry them up, you're eliminating the, the need for risk because somebody being offended by something is generally because they don't believe in what you believe in. Of course, there are like, we don't want to go, like you're saying something that's completely politically incorrect and that most of Australia or whoever your audience is, is going to say, no, we, we don't agree. But I think if you can get into the psyche of your customers, then that's a really big step in the way of minimizing risk. Thank you. Yes. I, it's a really harebrain idea, but if you're not sure, ask your customers, <laughs> like have a chat to them. And this is something that I'm sure that you're very familiar with coming from corporate and big agency. Same with me. We would actually focus group our campaign ideas and our marketing ideas and bring in customers that represented our target audience and share the concepts with them and say, hey, this is a little bit of a deviation for our brand or this is a new direction. What do you think? And invite them to be part of the conversation before you launch something that is potentially too risky and actually pick up the phone and talk to your customers. Absolutely. And don't, you know, I think sometimes people can get, they can survey not their customers, asking friends and family who aren't actually the end user of whatever business it is. That is not going to get you the answers that you need. You need to understand your actual customers. Absolutely. 100%. Okay. So you are a brand strategist, Suji, and brand strategy is one of those marketing terms that is just so misunderstood. There's this misconception that brand strategy is complicated and expensive. Do you think that you could demystify this for us? It does. The name, for some reason, it sounds so ambiguous. And so I understand why people think that it is complicated. And it's like, what do you actually do? Are you a designer? Are you a marketer? Are you like, oh, where, who are you? I see brand strategy is it, it needs to be, all marketers really should be brand strategists, I believe, because why are we focusing on the tactical end result, just the ads? People understand an ad because they see an ad on TV. They've grown up around them. But underneath an ad is all the mechanics of why are we doing this ad in the first place? How does that ad get our business to be where we want it to be in the long term? And then it starts asking those essential questions. That's what brand strategy is. And I think good marketing, that everybody who does good marketing should understand those key factors first. So, and I guess sometimes in agency world or the business world, these roles are hidden behind, they're just behind the behind the scenes. We've got people in research who are creating these reports and pulling the data in. And it's the marketers, I guess, who are seen to pull off the ads and, and, you know, that were behind those big ideas. But there is actually a team of, strategists and business sort of advisory that that create that information to start with. Oh, absolutely. So for me, brand strategy, I think it comes down to three key questions, which is one, who are we targeting? Two, what do we want to be known for? And three, 
How are we going to achieve that? And so you can make that as complicated as you like, but actually I think the most sophisticated strategies are the most simple that can really answer those questions very clearly and um, non-ambiguously. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, I love that breakdown of what brand strategy is. And I did think that, yeah, if you're in marketing or even if you're your own business owner, you have to be your own brand strategist because you can answer those questions for yourself. Absolutely. All right. So in amongst all the things that brands need to do to market their business, where does the brand strategy piece fit in the process? The very, 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 very beginning. (laughs) So for me, it's so connected to business strategy. (laughs) It's, you know, the brand and the business are actually, I believe, formed at the same time. If you are creating in a startup world, you know, if you're product based, for example, you might be going out and sourcing products and samples and things like that. But at the same time, you need to be looking into the future and answering these questions. You said, where do, where do I want to be in 5, 10, 20 years? Who is actually, and not, not like every, this product is not for everybody, who is actually that one person that is buying this product and what problems do they really have that we can solve? And then marry those two things. Like, like I said, it's like how are we going to get there? Like that is just as important as those often really fun parts of a business like finding product or creating your services, it has to happen at the start. And it also, once you answer those questions, it gives you a lens to be like, oh, actually that product's right or it needs a tweak or you know, can it completely or that service is right, wrong, needs a tweak, etc. Oh, I wholeheartedly agree. So last year, my business partner left our business and I was transitioning to becoming a solo business owner. And that required a change in brand name, a change in our whole company name, really. And before I picked up the phone to a single designer to think about new logos and new names, I spent a couple of weeks over the Christmas break writing my brand strategy because how were they supposed to create an entire visual identity and a name for a brand when I haven't gotten clear on those elements? Like, who is this brand for? What problem do I solve for customers? Why do I exist? What do I want to be known for? And it just absolutely tickles me pink when people refer to me as the campaign lady or the campaign guru or, you know, any of those words. I'm, even though I don't love the word guru, I just love that I'm so closely associated with campaigns because that's exactly the positioning that I want for my business. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And I love that example of, because again, marketing words have this tendency to be really confusing and ambiguous positioning. It's like when somebody says in in business campaign, you want to be near or campaign classroom campaign Del Mar. That's the associations that you want to get. And that that's positioning. Exactly. So true. All right. So brand strategy comes first. We do not pass go. We do not collect $200. It's first. Then we can go into brand identity and uh, brand voice and brand messaging and any of those sort of tactical elements. But as you know, Suji, I'm low key obsessed I don't know why I say low-key, I'm high-key obsessed with marketing campaigns. So how does your brand (laughs) strategy fit with your marketing campaigns? How do those two things come together? Yeah, I did a bit of homework on your question because I thought that was a good one. And then I kind of come up with this idea of Aldi. I was like looking around and I was like, get into the mood for good chats. I was like, you know what, Aldi, I do. I love an Aldi ad. Like don't watch a lot of TV, but when you see an Aldi ad, it just nails it. So I just wanted to break it down a bit on where brand strategy sits and talk a little bit with their their campaigns and how I see the two fit together with an example. So business-wise with Aldi, you go back a long time that, you know, they came, they were a new player on the market, but they were in this perceived in this discount cheap sort of, you know, you come to us because it's cheaper to shop here and people just had this perception that they were cheap. They knew that business strategy-wise, they actually wanted to transition away from that and be able to compete, especially in Australia, and they do this in different markets as well with the top players, Woolworths and Coles. I don't know if we're mentioning names here, but they knew that that's what they wanted to compete with. So that became their business strategy, which also is part of their brand strategy. So the way they wrapped that up is with this great line, it's like good, different, fantastic. And I think in terms of brand strategy, see this with Aldi, 
everything they do is it's a little bit different, whether it's the brands in store that they get, but they're still good. They're the same product. Sometimes that they're just a little bit different to how we usually buy them. The way that they, you know, stock their shelves, the way that you have to pack your own bags and the way that staff, you, they have their sitting down, like that's all brand sort of activities that link very closely to things that we're going to do things differently. And then I see that Aldi run their campaigns and like that's a campaign that's always on that, you know, good different is always on. But I see that then they've got these like creative campaigns that still have the spirit of being different and they have this like outlandish sort of funny personality. And they, I tend to see that they sort of spike on and off. And then that's also, you know, the, the buzz that that campaign gets for Aldi, whether it's their Christmas campaign or they did something for COVID, that just adds more equity into their, their, the idea of being good different. And it gets, you know, more buzz, but I sort of see that they're on and off. Those campaigns are always on. And that's how I sort of broke it down with the brand strategy, any campaign strategy. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. So every year I look forward to Aldi's Christmas campaign because it is always good and it is always so perfectly on brand. And that's what you're saying is that these campaigns are very funny, irreverent, sometimes a bit cheeky, but they always align with the underlying brand strategy for Aldi that it is good difference. So that is an absolutely amazing example. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Thanks for prepping me with that question. I would have been a bit a bit thrown if it was on the spot. <laughs> no worries. Those uh, podcast discussion guides are always a, uh, a win. <laughs> they are. <laughs> so when, <laughs> for me, I always say that your campaigns should look different to your always on marketing. They should, you know, capture attention and and you're only going to achieve that if it's not your regular programming. But they shouldn't be like strangers. And my friend Rachel Remy uh, says that they should be cousins. <laughs> your campaigns <laughs> and your like brand, <laughs> your brand strategy or your marketing strategy to your campaigns, they should be cousins. So they're re- they're related, but they're not the same. So I really like I that, that analogy one. as a yeah, <laughs> so good. So tell us about your campaigns for The Good Studio. What are you working on? What, is it, what does it look like for you in real life? At the moment, it's all about boring is bad for business. So we've brought that out to life with our podcast and we have got an idea that we, we brainstormed together and it's in campaign classroom and it's going, again, the idea that boring is bad for business. I don't want to give away too much, but we're actually going to do something that's completely unboring and basically tell, helping people how to create a non-boring brand, but we're doing it in a non-boring way. And that's, you know, we're hoping that I'll be out in sort of mid-year, but it's going offline as well. We're going back to our basics where, you know, we're both designers. We came sort of grew up in the age of print. I give you some some ideas there. But I guess with our marketing, what we're trying to do is really demonstrate ways that you can do business without being boring. And that, you know, for us, that was getting offline, getting into the print space. Oh my gosh, that's a juicy tip. I can't wait for this. I am intrigued for sure. (laughs) Got Marketing is brought to you by Campaign Delmar, a marketing education platform for marketers and entrepreneurs. Master the foundations of marketing, nail your email marketing strategy, or join Campaign Classroom and learn to create memorable, effective marketing campaigns. These are not the kind of online programs where you are left floundering, unsure how to put theory into practice, nor will these programs sit unfinished for months. You can expect hands-on tailored advice, accountability, and a supportive community. And you will walk away with practical, repeatable marketing skills. Learn more at campaigndelmar.com. Okay. So boring is bad for business. So how do we go about being non-boring or unboring? So I have some favorite brainstorm techniques, but I would love to hear yours as a brand strategist. Like what's the starting point for unboring marketing? Yeah. My starting point is a little bit boring, unfortunately. So my starting point for us is I, well, it does sound boring, but it gets the juicy like details that we need. So, you know, when we work with clients, the first thing that we do is we actually take them through a workshop. So an our end product is a brand identity system and also a website. So a lot of the time when you're getting those services, somebody would ask you to fill out a brief. 
we don't do that. We actually get the, the client to come into the room. And if they are local, they will come into our studio and they're here for about four or five hours. If it's on Zoom, it does work on Zoom as well. We've adapted and it's actually been great to have COVID. Every, it, we were open to it, but clients sometimes felt a little not so opening up on, on the screen. And we sit down and we ask them questions so they don't prepare anything. And we have, and what we're doing in that workshop is we're really asking all of those questions that we discussed before, like, what do you want to be known for? Who are your customers? Explain to me in your own words, like, what's the culture of your company like? What is, you know, what are some things that people say about you? And what do you want to be, you know, what's that ex- special X fact that you have? And in that, that time, Joel and I are sitting in there with the client and these conversations is literally, people are brain dead. I'm so like, they're, they're exhausted by the time they leave. They literally are like, wow, A, that felt like kind of like therapy for me and B I am just have so much going around in my brain right now. That was huge. Like I'm, I'm quite exhausted. You really made me stop and think and analyze. And that's that gathering information is key. I think for us to create a non-boring idea, Joel and I then go like my role from that point is then to sort of put that into notes, but often the good ideas don't come from the notes that I create. Unfortunately, they come from the things that we didn't, you can't verbalize this. The things that we sort of heard or we, the way that we saw someone react to a comment. And then our process is we don't really have a big structure. We sit down and we go, okay, great. Like we've got, this is like, we've mapped out the positioning. We've mapped out, done a bit of some analysis on the competitors. We really understand what these business leaders or the founders want to be known for. And we've done a deep dive on their customers. Let's start just spitballing and bouncing ideas off each other. And it's, we often start with words and it's lines. That's how my brain works. I don't know if yours is similar, but it's often the lines and the, the short words and like sort of snappy sentences, almost like a tagline that we think would suit for this. And then we just start going and how could that look in visual form? And what else could you do with that? Oh, wow. That's awesome. Gosh, that workshop sounds amazing. Like therapy for your brand, like going and having like spa <laughs> treatments for your brand. That sounds so good. Like what a rejuvenating experience. Yeah. I really, really think that that is such a great way to approach it because then when you've done the work, like you said, any ideas that come out of that are going to align with the brand. So you've again, minimize the risk of any of these ideas being too OTT or just not in alignment with the brand. So that's, you know, very strategic way to approach creative development. And then it's really interesting that you start with words. I actually don't. One of my favorite brainstorming techniques, which we're going to do in the brainstorm party, is rapid fire brainstorming, where we come up with what I like to call big ideas. So more like the concept. And it's hard to explain. I really struggle to put the big idea into words because it's not words and it's not just visual it's almost like the theme of the campaign like what what is the theme that runs through the messaging that runs through the channels that links all the moving parts of the campaign together the great thing about rapid fire brainstorming that I find is that you don't stop to like get in your head and psych yourself out about the ideas. Oh, that sucks. Oh, that's never going to work. Oh, that's shit. Oh, that's boring. You, because it's about quantity at this point, not about quality, it just allows you to lift those shackles of self-doubt and just come out with all the ideas, crazy or not, and you get past the boring. You're like, okay, that's been done. That's obvious. So let's move past those ideas and start to get to the good stuff. And so I really like it. And then, of course, we need to go back and validate and qualify those ideas to make sure that they're actually going to work. But we do that only once we have a big bank of really creative, different ideas to pull from. I love that. And I'm always keen for, I'm definitely, well, I'm going to be at the brainstorming party as well. Always keen for new techniques for brainstorming because it's, it, that's the thing. It's like creativity doesn't have a structure or it's not linear. So always, I'm going to definitely try that more rapid fire. And yeah, keen to know about what you, how you break down that, what that theme kind of is in the brainstorm party. Yeah. So the way that we kind of ask people to come to the brainstorm party, like, prepared with a question. And this is a very common technique in 
design thinking and it's the how might we statement. So you reframe the business opportunity or problem but from a customer perspective. And so it's like how might we reposition the good studio as a brand that is known for unboring marketing ideas. And so then it gives everyone in the room a really great catalyst from which to ideate ideas based on that very specific how might we statement that's created for that particular brand so that we're making sure that we're coming up with ideas that are relevant, that meet the objectives, that meet the target audience. And so we'll spend a bit of time doing that how might we statement and then we jump into the rapid fire brainstorming. And often one brainstorm session might not get the job done. So do another one, like do it with some different people, do it with your business partner or with your team. And I really feel that even though I say marketing is not a tap that you can turn on and off. When the tap is on though, it can really start to flow. So over the 21 years in my career, I've managed to turn that tap on a little bit more. And now it's so much easier for me to get into that creative state because I figured out what helps me get there, what inspires me, what I need to do to get ready for those creative juices to start flowing and to get to the good stuff earlier. But the first couple of years, there was a lot of like resistance. I'm a suit. I don't do this kind of work. I'm the account director. I'm the brand manager. I look at the data. I look at the numbers. I don't get to do the fun, creative stuff. And it's like, why not? (laughs) Why not? (laughs) Exactly. You've got those insights and that sometimes that gut feel on an idea or a thread to follow. It comes from good insight, not sometimes, it always comes from good insight. A hundred percent, like all the best marketing campaigns in the world, the ones that you remember, you know, Think Small, Volkswagen, Got Milk, uh, Diamond is Forever, all of them are insight driven. Every single one comes from a relatable human truth. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love with your brainstorming technique, I was just thinking it's solutions focused, especially when you ask that, how might we? And I think that probably opens up your mind to possibility. And it's not just sort of like, you know, in our style of brainstorming, sometimes, yeah, we can get in that like holding pattern where it's like, "Mm, no, not feeling any of these, like, where do we go to next? Whereas with, you know, asking that, how might we, anything is possible and it can be outlandish. And that's, that's actually fantastic. Yeah, well, I think often people come to the table with a business problem. How might we increase our market share of red lipstick in Victoria? It's like every idea that I'm going to have for that is going to be business profit revenue focused. It is not going to be a marketing solution. It is going to be like, I know, let's do a consumer promotion. There is nothing more boring than a price discount. Let's just be clear on that, right? Agreed, agreed. So by reframing the problem from a customer perspective and from that solution perspective, like you mentioned, Suji, then it opens us up to many more possibilities and gives us so much more fodder from which to jump off from because we're thinking outside our business problem and we're thinking, you know, big picture. Absolutely. And you're thinking what the customer wants, again, coming back to those core core values of brand strategy or the core factors of brand strategy, it's what your customer needs, not what the business needs. The business needs the customers to buy the product. So get into the customer's headspace. Oh, absolutely. Oh, amazing. Well, I think that that is a great place to wrap up this chat. I would love for people to be able to come and connect with you. So can you let us know the best way to do that? Absolutely. The best way to do that is probably two methods, the Good Studios Instagram. So we are thegood.studio on Instagram. And also you can reach us via email if you are more traditional and want to know that it definitely lands in our hot hands. And that email address is hello at thegoodstudio.com.au. Oh, amazing. I'm going to put all of that in the show notes. And also I urge everyone to go and have a listen to Boring is Bad for Business, the podcast, which launched very recently because it is bound to be very juicy with extra pulp. Thank you so much for joining me, Suji. It was such an absolute pleasure. And I am so excited to see what comes next on your journey with The Good Studio. Thank you, Mia. It was a blast to come on here and talk all things brand strategy and big ideas and brainstorming. Thank you. 
You listened right up until the end. So why not hit that subscribe button and keep the good marketing rolling? Podcast reviews are like warm hugs, and they're also the best way to support a small business. You can connect with me, Mia Feilman, on Instagram or LinkedIn, and feel free to send me a message. I'm super friendly.